Okay, so good morning. Do I need a microphone? No, no. Okay, because that microphone's only going to give you feedback, and I'm not sure you want feedback this morning. Anyway, so it is March the 2nd, and that means it's International Women's Month, and uh, next week, uh, Friday, will be International Women's Day that started on March the 8th. 1978 in Santa Rosa, California, where a bunch of women got together, saluted to womenhood, and the United Nations picked up on it, and it eventually became International Women's Day, and it's International Women's Month. So I'm going to be talking about 1922, which was a pretty big year for women gaining some equality with men. Because of this, the uh, Women's World Games or the Women's Only Olympics. And of course you had the flappers in 1922. And you had Prohibition. Anybody uh, with a mother or an aunt who was a flapper? No? Anybody with relatives who made bathtub gin? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Also the Ku Klux Klan is going strong. Uh, the Lincoln Memorial is completed in Washington, D.C. in 1922. Uh, technology is evolving. Look at that. That's a radio set. The whole family is sitting around the radio. And there would be the first big star on radio in 1922. Warren G. Harding has a problem with his cronies or his cabinet members as uh, they're stealing oil from uh, the Teapot Dome area in Wyoming. Uh, Fatty Arbuckle. Anybody here know who Fatty Arbuckle was? Well, he was a great silent film star comedian who uh, was accused of murdering Virginia Rappé and raping her and faced three trials. Uh, so Hollywood needed a cleansing after that. Uh, Hitler in 1922. Uh, and Mussolini, he rises to power in 1922. And Back in the USSR, Lenin is getting sick and Stalin is becoming the guy in the USSR. Oh, women's rights in the 1800s. Uh, let me read some of these rights to you and you tell me what you think. Uh, women's rights denied. In the 1880s, American women had fewer rights than a male in an insane asylum. Uh, women could not vote serve on the jury, they're going to try to get me on the jury next week until I tell them about my background in journalism and meaning, you know, being, having murderers paraded in front of me and meeting some of the worst lawyers, liars, lawyers, liars you can ever meet, you know, in, uh, as a defendant client. Testify in court, hold public office. You couldn't attend college as a woman unless you had money. Uh, practice law. If a woman were married, it was illegal for her to sign a contract, own or inherit property, although Martha Washington had the property for George. Uh, keep or invest her own earnings, have automatic rights to children. Women were expected to center their lives around family and home, obey their husbands in all matters. <laughs> Nobody is responding other than laughter to that. Uh, not voice strong opinions in public. Well, that wouldn't be my mother-in-law. Uh, behave in a refined and polite manner. Uh, women want rights. Now, in 1920, most, but not all women in the United States, got the right to vote. If you were Native American, you didn't get the right. If you were African American woman, they made it very, very hard for you to vote. Now, New Zealand gave women the right to vote in 1893. That was the first nation or territory to formally allow women to vote in natural and uh, rather national elections. At least 19 other countries also did prior to the United States in the passage of the uh, 19th Amendment allowing women to vote in 1920. These countries spread across Europe and Asia included Russia, which gave the women the right to vote in 1917. Now, let me just say this about America. There were states that allowed women to vote locally. Uh, places like Idaho and Utah and Colorado back in the uh, 1890s along with Wyoming. Um, but uh, it took a while for women. And in fact, 
New York State, 1917, after Wyoming, was, women were allowed to vote. Uh, women struggled to gain equal rights in the sports arena was a battlefield. Um, have you ever heard of this one? It wasn't ladylike or it isn't ladylike to play sports. Now, go back to high school. Um, women, go back to high school. Were you allowed to play full court basketball in phys ed? And the answer was no. The reason why? It was too tiring for a woman or a teenage woman to run up and down the courts. Which leads me to this uh, next question that you might be able to answer for me. Uh, if, if women are the weaker sex, how come they outlive men? Because they want to, according to Myra Cohn. Anyway, um, so women didn't participate in sports, but in suburban New York City and Westchester County, the wives of the Gilded Age millionaires wanted to play golf. And that kind of turns things around, at least in Westchester. Uh, this is a club on Jackson Avenue that still exists on the Scarsdale uh, Yonkers border. And it's one of the oldest private clubs, St. Andrews, in the United States. Um, and, you, and that picture was all men. Uh, in 1895, John Reed, who was one of the guys who brought golf over from uh, Scotland in 1888, his wife Elizabeth and several other women leased land on the, uh, in Yonkers on North Broadway and established the Skagkill Country Club after St. Andrews and people who were part of the St. Andrews included Andrew Carnegie and that ilk, uh, slammed its doors on them. Sag Hill moved to another site on the Hudson River in 1896 and it had about 100 members, mostly women. And there is the Skag Hill Golf Course in Yonkers. Now, what the women did was open the door for men to play baseball and golf on Sundays in Westchester County because there were blue laws. And this is from the New York Times. This is 1896. Can play golf Sunday. Jury at Yonkers finds player not guilty of breaking the law. The jurors congratulated on their decision. Attorney and judge have a warm tilt. Well, they were yelling at each other. Special to the New York Times, Yonkers, June 7th, in a courtroom crowded with prominent residents of this place, the question as to the right of man, not woman, man, to play golf on Sunday in Yonkers was decided here by the discharge of Benjamin Adams. Mr. Adams was arrested last Sunday for playing the game on the links of the Skagkill Golf Club. He was tried before Judge Kellogg in a jury of six and was discharged, but only after a hard-fought legal battle during which there was an angry exchange of words by Judge Kellogg and Joseph F. Daly, one of the attorneys of the defendant. The decision was received joyfully by those who played baseball and members of the Skagkill Golf Club club of which the defendant is a member. So men got to play because women stood up and said, we're keeping this golf course open on Sunday, forget your blue laws. Uh, women did make a major advance in golf. 1894, the Amateur Golf Association was formed, established the first women's tournament. First women's amateur took place in 1895 in Jericho. Not very far from here, right? Jericho. Women were being accepted, at least in golf, but the Olympics, which was revived in 1896, no women. We didn't want any women in the Olympics. In 1896, at the first modern Olympic Games held in Athens, Greece, there were no women participants. You can't see that picture well, but I'm going to tell you who's in this picture. It is a woman, and she is dressed from neck to toe, complete with a hat, and she's going to play tennis in that outfit. That's what she's going to play tennis in. And it was acceptable for the men in the Olympics. And there's a reason why, which I'll get into in a couple of minutes, why she is dressed from head to toe. Women did take part in the 1900 Olympic Games in Paris, and Lonnie Cooper, Britain, became the first female Olympic champion in tennis. Uh, the Games for Women 
uh, were scheduled, were expanded to include archery, and then in 1912, uh, women uh, also were able to participate in sports such as aquatics and gymnastics. But there were no teams, no uh, team competition like running for women. This is Baron Pierre de Coubertin. He is the guy who uh, came up with the concept of let's have another Olympics, and it starts in 1896. Well, de Coubertin tried to marginalize women's sports. After the 1912 Stockholm Games, he and many of his uh, International Olympic Committee colleagues believed an Olympiad with females would be impractical, uninteresting, unesthetic, and improper. What do you think? Boo. 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 <laughs> You're booing that. Well, here is uh, the morality of the Baron. Here's the guy who did not want women around, and he had his reasons. Uh, he argued because of biological reasons, sports were too violent for women. I'm going to ask you a question. Archery is what, that and that? So would that be violent? And golf is like you walk, you hit a ball, you watch the ball go there, and you walk after the ball. How violent is that? Uh, furthermore, he argued that uh, women's athletic exhibitions would erode society's morals by arousing the passions of male spectators. That's why that woman was dressed from neck down to her feet trying to play tennis. Anyway, that was the Olympics. In the Olympics back in those days, I'll be giving you a talk in um, July when the Olympics come about, and I'll tell you about the anthropology, anthropology games in 1904 in St. Louis which featured the savages of Africa in an experiment. So these, I don't know, you know, I, I've dealt with these people too long. But uh, so what do you think? Male spectators got excited watching a woman, uh, you know, shooting a bow and arrow? They thought they did. In uh, 1904, the International Olympic Committee general session made it clear. No women to participate in track and field, but as before, allowed to participate in fencing and swimming. Well, World War I also started in 1914, and as the war continued, it would knock out the 1916 Olympics. But the war was eventually going to be over. And this woman, nobody here has ever heard of Alice Millier, have they? Well, she is a pioneer, a woman's rights pioneer. She's from France. Uh, she came to the fore, born in uh, uh, Nantes, France in 1894. She was a rower. Uh, she joined the Femina sport uh, before the First World War and became its president in 1915. She wanted to compete in the rowing competitions in 1916. As you know, World War I broke out. There was no Olympics in uh, 1916. But the war meant that men were off to fight and women would have to take over their responsibilities. And the women would prove to be more than capable and up to the challenge in both sports and industry. A munitions factory during World War I in England. Uh, there was a company called Dick Kerr and Company. It was in Preston, England. And it was a locomotive and tram car manufacturer that was converted to become a munitions production plant at the outbreak of World War I in 1914. The female workers who replaced the men who were off to war at the business uh, were allowed to play soccer on the facility's grounds, and they showed an exceptional aptitude and ability to play the game. Dick Kerr's ladies beat a uh, rival factory, Arundo Courthart, 4-0 on Christmas Day, 1917, and there were more than 10,000 people in attendance at Deepdale Stadium. Boxing Day, December 26, 1920, 53,000 people watched Dick Kerr's ladies beat St. Helens' ladies 4-0. What do you think the men thought when they saw that number, 53,000 people in attendance to watch a woman's game? What do you think the men thought? They didn't think much. In fact, they were jealous. Oh, that's the team. They look like uh, prisoners, don't they? 
Dick Kerr's Ladies. After the war, Dick Kerr's Ladies played uh, matches to raise money for the National Association of Discharged and Disabled Soldiers and Sailors in England. They won most of their games. And they were led by this woman, Lily Park, who was about six feet tall, smoked cigarettes while she was playing soccer, cursed like a sailor. Wouldn't surprise me if she drank as well while she played. She may be still the greatest soccer, women's soccer player of all time. In 1921, Dick Kerr's ladies, that, they were at their popularity peak. Willie Park was the star, and tens of thousands of uh, fans came to more than 60 games that year, and the men are watching, and they're not happy. Uh, Park started her Dick Kerr career at the age of 14. She scored 43 goals her first year. Uh, the team won, uh, played in 828 matches, won 758, drew 46, lost only 24. As a team, while they were together, they scored more than 3,500 goals. Parr scored about 1,000 of them. But England decides, the FA, the Football Association, that's it. And they were the governing body at that point of uh, football. That's it. We don't want women to play soccer anymore. We've had it, we've had enough. And basically, it was over. It was over. December 5th, 1921, the Football Association, uh, which was the governing body of football or soccer, had enough of women playing the game. The FA told women, play soccer on the recreational level. The FA would not supply referees to officiate women's matches and eventually took the fields away. Uh, they felt they, it wasn't ladylike. Look at them. That's not ladylike. What is ladylike, by the way? Anybody can tell me what ladylike is? Because I never met anybody who could tell me what ladylike was. Maybe back in the 1800s, a woman who kowtows to her husband. The FA concluded that women should not be playing football or soccer because it was quite unsuitable for females and ought not to be encouraged. The uh, Dick Kerr ladies uh, toured North America uh, in 1922 following the English ban, and that was supposed to be the end of it. They were supposed to go to Canada, but guess what? Canada was an English colony and still under the thumb, even though they were a separate country allegedly starting in 1867, but they were still under the English thumb. So they arrived in Canada and told, you're not welcome to. Uh, so they ended up touring uh, the United States for nine games, and that was the end of it. The men wanted to put down soccer and end it in 1922. Oh, the FA doctors uh, who said that soccer posed a uh, serious physical uh, risk for women uh, because the men running uh, the FA wanted them to say so, and they did and they were barred from playing at the highest level. So, getting back to Alice Milliette, who will not be honored this month, although she should be, she probably will be honored in France. Uh, in 1919, Milliette asked Olympic officials to let women compete uh, in track and field at the 1920 Olympics in Antwerp, Belgium. Uh, Pierre de Corbetin, founder of the Modern Olympics and then president of the International Olympic Committee was strongly opposed. Milliet had enough of it. That's it. And it's time to act. The war was over. There wasn't a sufficient excuse for not allowing women to compete in track and field events. In fact, she wasn't even in the track and field event. She was a rower. Uh, here is Antwerp, the Belgian Olympics, the Summer Olympics. In the uh, 1920 Summer Games, the first in eight years, 65 women did show up, competed in swimming, diving, and figure skating. Milliette, not allowed to uh, compete in the 1920 Olympics. There was no competition for her. She decided to do something about it and show those men, women were going to get, there, or going to do what they needed to do to get recognition, and there she is. Uh, she was the founder and president of the uh, Feminine Sports uh, Federation International that started operations in Paris, October 1921. Earlier that year, she organized the 1921 Women's Olympiad, the first ever international uh, sports event 
it was for five days between uh, Mar uh, was a five uh, day multi uh, sport event held between March 24th and 30th uh, in Monte Carlo. And it was in response to the International Olympic Committee's decision to kick all women out of the 1924 Olympics. The athletes competed in 10 events running 60 meters, 250 meters, 800 meters, 4 by 75 meters relay, 4 by 175 meters relay hurdling 65 meters, high jump, long jump, standing long jump, exhibition only, javelin and shot put. Uh, there were exhibition events in basketball, gymnastics, push ball, and ryth uh, rhythmic gymnastics. Five nations competed, France, Italy, Norway, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. It was a great success. And because it was a great success, let's have our own Olympics. And that is what happened. The 1922 Olympics take place. It would be the first of four women-only Olympics. 1922, 1926, 1930, 1934. Uh, it was the first regular international women's world games, first track and field competitions for women. The tournament was held on one day, February 20th in Paris attended by 77 athletes, Czechoslovakia, France, Great Britain, Switzerland, and the United States. And because the United States was there, so was the New York Times. Uh, Milliet's event captured the attention in Paris. 20,000 people witnessed the event. And it was another successful presentation by Milliet. And it got positive reviews from the New York Times, which was a big deal back then. This is the Women Olympiad, and this is uh, just from a newspaper. American Girl Record Breakers and Olympic Scorers. Uh, and here are the Americans. U.S. Girls Smash Records in Paris. And the New York Times wrote a glowing review. 1922 Women's Olympics was notable for the development of women athletes in all branches of competition fitting to their sex. Remarkable progress was made by them, and almost overnight, they assumed a uh, place of great prominence in the world of athletics. Milliet still had hoped to convince Olympic officials to let women compete in track and field on an equal footing with men. The women's movement was not limited to just sporting games. Uh, the, the United States had uh, two African-American <coughs> women who were part of the 1932 team and were allowed to perform, Louise Stokes and Tidy Pickett, in the 1936 Berlin Games. They became the first two American women athletes to participate in track and field. Flappers. Any of you have flapper relatives? Nobody? You didn't have a mother who danced on tabletops in high heels, had short skirts, and drank and smoked, and went into speakeasies? <coughs> I have one woman who told me she did, up in the atria in uh, Riverdale. And she said her mother was the black sheep of the family. Uh, they came from the Lower East Side, moved, moved to Brooklyn, and they were Orthodox Jews. And she went to Erasmus High School and graduated college, Brooklyn College. That made her the black sheep of the family. She was a college-educated woman. So. Uh, Anyway, that's Olive Thomas, and uh, she was in a uh, Selznick movie called The Flapper. She met an unfortunate end to her life. Uh, the first appearance of the flapper style in the United States came from the popular 1920 Frances Marion film, The Flapper, starring Olive Thomas. Uh, she uh, starred in a similar role in 1917, but it wasn't until that movie, The Flapper, that the term was used. In the United States, popular contempt for prohibition was a factor in the rise of the flappers, with legal saloons and cabarets closed, back alley speakeasies became prolific and popular. The discrepancy between the law-abiding, religious-based temperance movement and consumption, consumption of alcohol led to widespread disdain for authority. 1922, a small circulation magazine, The Flapper, published in Chicago, celebrated the Flapper's appeal. On the opening page of its first issue, it proudly declared Flappers break with traditional values. 
and there is the uh, Flapper uh, uh, magazine. 20 cents, a lot of money back in those days. $3.60 today if you wanted to buy that, the Flapper magazine. Uh, unlike their mothers and grandmothers, flappers tended to go to high school and even college. That's when that woman told me about the black sheep in the family, her mother, who graduated college. Flappers went to work as well. According to a report, some banks across the United States start to regulate dress and deportment of young female employers, employees rather, who were considered flappers. They didn't want flappers to work for them even though they were probably very capable if they were all high school and college graduates. The anti-flapper code still soon spread to the Federal Reserve, where female employees were firmly told there was no time to beautify themselves during office hours. I guess uh, some of the companies didn't want women to come dressed like that into work. And that's what uh, flapper dressed as back in those days. Uh, flappers set the stage for a much more liberated view of women's sexuality in that they made it so that women would no longer be considered impure, immoral, uh, dangerous for engaging in casual, consensual sexual activities. The flappers, of course, were a grave concern, like that woman who was telling me, to their parents, to their grandparents, to educators, to physicians, to uh, clergymen who feared that sports and higher education would be ruinous. How many of you went to college here? You went to college. Did that ruin your life? No. Did that ruin other people's lives? No. no. But that was the thought back then. Women going to college, that's going to kill. That's going to kill everything. Flappers went to speakeasies, which was a place where they could drink alcohol, provided by gangsters. Well, to get into a speakeasy, you needed to know the password. Harpo Marx knew the password, swordfish, speakeasies. You had to speak the password like this to get in. Uh, when Prohibition took effect on January 17, 1920, many thousands of formerly legal saloons across the country catering to only men closed down. People wanting to drink had to buy liquor from licensed druggists uh, for medicinal purposes. I want to get drunk. Let's go to the druggist. Oh, good. Give me that. Good. See, I'm all better. Uh, a clergyman for religious reasons or illegal sellers known as bootleggers. Another option was to enter these uh, private, unlicensed bar rooms, the speakeasies, for how low you had to speak the password to get entry into it. Uh, so, not o uh, so you wouldn't be uh, overheard by law enforcement. Guess who also was in the speakeasies? Cops who wanted a drink. They weren't going to write you out. Well, I did have a woman uh, about two weeks ago telling me about Prohibition. She was living in Hartford. It was kind of the end of Prohibition, around 3031. And her father's speakeasy was busted. And his, uh, his uh, face was all over the Hartford current. And she was about five years old. And she was made fun of at school. But, uh, yeah, they, they decided to bust that speakeasy. Uh, but inside the speakeasy, you might have a good time as well. Look at this guy playing the piano and all. Prohibition was difficult to enforce. The demand for alcohol was outweighing the demand for sobriety. People found clever ways to evade prohibition agents. They carried hip flasks, uh, hollow canes, false books, and the alike. Neither federal nor local authorities would uh, commit resources needed to enforce the uh, Prohibition Act. In general, prohibition was enforced more strongly in areas where the population was sympathetic to the legislation, mainly rural areas and small towns, and it wasn't enforced in urban areas. Uh, there were about an estimated 50,000 speakeasies in Manhattan alone. Now, a speakeasy might be somebody with a bathtub trying to mix a drink and having people over. 50,000 of those around. Uh, not all of them look like that. That looks like a nice bar, doesn't it? Uh, there were also many unintended consequences in Prohibition. Some cash-strapped restaurants 
shuttered their doors, they could no longer make a profit because they didn't have a li liquor license or liquor sales. Thousands of people died every year from drinking cheap moonshine tainted with toxins. As revenue shrank for many states, uh, they could not pay uh, for roads and schools and other public benefits because the liquor taxes weren't there anymore. From Los Angeles to Chicago to New York, organized crime syndicates supplied speakeasies and underground establishments with large quantities of beer and liquor. These complex bootlegging operations use rivers, waterways, uh, and other methods to smuggle alcohol across state lines. And you talk about international waters, well, how about all that booze that came from Canada? Uh, all you had to do was put it on a speedboat, which could outgun the Coast Guard, get it to the other side, to the bootleggers, and you were all set. Uh, mobsters like Arnold Rothstein became incredibly rich from bootlegging, so rich he had his own fleet of ships bringing in the stuff from Europe. He knew it was coming. They didn't stop it. Well, this is America, 1922. How do you like that hat? I love it. You love that hat? You wear it? Nobody wears hats. Nobody wears hats, but that hat's pretty cool, isn't it? Anyway, the Roaring Twenties did not get off to a good start in America. At the conclusion of World War I, U.S. officials found themselves in a bleak situation. Federal debt had exploded because of wartime expenditures. By the way, how many of you had uh, parents who were born in the 19-teens? 19 19-teens, 1900s? Earlier. Then they experienced at least two depressions in the 1920s, not just one, two. Uh, the federal debt exploded because of wartime expenditures, the annual consumer Price inflation had jumped above 20% by the end of the war. Oh, the Spanish flu pandemic in the United States began in the spring 1918, returned in waves into 1920, killing 675,000 Americans, including two of my great uncles who died. Uh, and the family always said, no, they were poisoned by lovers. So were the other 675,000 family tale. Because a large fraction of the deaths were among working age adults, which they were at that time, uh, the resulting economic dislocation was especially severe. Unemployment rate, 11.7% 1921. Well, Warren G. Harding's new president of the United States, he gets all these guys together to figure out how do we get rid of the depression. Well, fortunately things changed in a hurry and America was out of the by 1921. Woodrow Wilson, well, his wife's term of office, Edith Wilson, was the de facto president because he had a stroke in uh, October 1919 and was an invalid and she was running the country. Anyway, his term of office ended March uh, 4th, 1921. Slow response to the Depression that started in 1920, criticized by those in the Republican Party, be honest with you, he probably had no idea. He had the stroke, he was paralyzed, he was an invalid. But he was still there. Harding was sworn in as president March 4th, 1921, uh, conveyed a president's conference on unemployment at the instigation uh, of the Commerce Secretary, Herbert Hoover, as a result of uh, high unemployment during the uh, recession. Uh, about 300 members of industry, banking, and labor were called together in September 1921 to discuss the problem of unemployment. Hoover organized uh, the Economic Conference and the Committee on Unemployment. The committee established a branch in every state having substantial unemployment along with sub-branches in local communities and mayor's emergency committees in 31 cities. The committee uh, contributed relief to the unemployed, also organized uh, collaboration between local and federal governments. Harding, in 1921, signed the emergency tariff of 1921 uh, for the uh, McCumber tariff, and the Secretary of Treasury, Andrew Mellon, successfully pushed for lower income tax rates to help the economy uh, recover. Guess who he cut the uh, rates up? 
the very rich. They paid less money in taxes. Officially, the recession or depression lasted from January 1920 to July 1921, 18 months. But that didn't mean Americans were rolling in money in 1922. The economic downturn reversed itself, more jobs opened, but the farmers were still suffering. And the farmers had been suffering since the end of World War I because they overproduced, there was too much product, and they couldn't get the prices they need, needed. There was one other problem in America. Racism and anti-immigrant sentiments were raging. This is Los Angeles, and that's the Ku Klux Klan. The New York World, long time out of uh, circulation newspaper, wins a Pulitzer Prize uh, for its uh, public service in exposing the Ku Klux Klan operations. Uh, the immigration or immigration and prohibition was causing cultural conflict and modernization helped resuscitate the Ku Klux Klan. Whereas the original KKK was violent, racist, uh, it came out of the Civil War. The modern Klan was driven by somewhat different circumstances. Uh, the KKK was anti-immigration, anti-union, anti-Catholics, anti-Jews, strongly in favor of prohibition, which was put in place in 1919 with the ratification of the 18th Amendment. Many white, lower class, Protestant Americans in the North and Midwest were fearful that immigrants were changing traditional American culture, and they responded with anti-Catholicism and anti-Semitism. Lincoln Memorial is dedicated, and this is rather interesting because wasn't Lincoln the guy who freed the slaves, right? He's the guy who freed the slaves. Well, you know, it's 57 years or so after he's killed, and uh, William Howard Taft signed the bill in 1911 when he was president of the United States in February to create a memorial to Abraham Lincoln. When the Lincoln Memorial was dedicated on May 30th, now Chief Justice Taft officiated the ceremony. Oh, this is Lincoln who freed the slaves, right? Seating was segregated. The ceremony's only black speaker was forced to drastically revise his speech to avoid spreading propaganda. A right, hundred years later, you have critical race theory and let's ban books, which changed. Rod, uh, Robert Todd Lincoln, the president's only surviving son, attended the ceremony, which featured speeches by Taft, Harding, and Robert Russell Moton, principal of the Tuskegee Institute, a historically black school in Alabama, and he could not speak his mind. Harding uh, won his election in 1920 by preaching a slogan, Return to Normalcy. But what was normalcy? Uh, the American economy was slightly uh, rebounding, but uh, Harding was no friend to farmers and didn't want to help them out. Uh, Harding signed off on limiting immigration in 1921. Guess who he wanted to keep out? Or that bill. Keep out the Jews, keep out the Catholics from Eastern Europe. Um, and the tax cuts to the rich, thanks to the Secretary of State, Andrew Bell. Harding supported Congressman Leah Das Dryers, uh, Dyers, rather, federal anti-lynching bill, which failed to pass. It took about a century for that anti-lynching bill to pass. Uh, return to normalcy. Well, he's, he's listening to radio. He's watching it. He's watching radio. That's the speaker. Harding embraced technology. The use of electricity became increasingly common. Mass production of motorized vehicles stimulated other industries, such as highway construction, rubber, steel, and buildings, as hotels were erected to accommodate tourists venturing on the roads. Uh, it would be Harding that would get Route 66 rolling. Uh, Economy boost, uh, this economic boost helped the nation out of the recession. To improve and expand the nation's highways, uh, Harding signed the Federal Highway Act of 1921. He wanted to promote aviation, 
convening a national conference on commercial aviation, discussions focused on safety matters, inspection of airplanes, airplanes before this weren't inspected. Oh yeah, anybody could uh, basically go in and fly a plane. You didn't need a license. On February 8th, Harding had the first radio installed in the White House. This received national press attention. Uh, there's Harding on radio. There he is. He's on radio. On June 14th, Warren G. Harding became the first president to have his voice transmitted by radio. He addressed the crowd at a dedication ceremony in Baltimore for a memorial to Francis Scott Key, who wrote the lyrics for the Star Spangled Banner, and that was not the national anthem at that point. He was a technology buff. When he installed the, the radio in the White House, there were just 28 stations in operation. By the year's end, there were 500 stations around the country. Well, the government did not regulate the uh, business or the frequencies, so you could get radio all over the place, interfering with every state or other stations. How many of you know Ed Wynn? Ed Wynn, comedian. Ask kids today, do you know who Ed Wynn is? Probably not. Probably not. Ed Wynn was a big time vaudevillian and a comedian back in his day. He is the first star on radio a show called The Perfect Fool. It's February 19th, Ed Wynn becomes the first big vaudeville star to join radio. First broadcast is Wynn's The Perfect Fool, and it's on WJZ New York. First time in the world that a radio show is broadcast before a studio audience. On March 10th, in the United States, Variety Magazine prints front page headline, Radio Sweeping the Country, one million sets in use. And those things were not cheap back in those days. They averaged about $89 a set, and you multiply that about 20 now, and what do you get? Uh, about. Uh, about $1,700 a radio, something like that. Uh, maybe more, $2,000 a radio. WOR in New York debuts, WWL in New Orleans, WLW in Cincinnati, Brazil and France and Russia see the start of commercial radio. This is what gets Warren G. Harding in trouble. Warren G. Harding did a lot of good things, an awful lot of good things during his brief tenure as president. But this thing would be the tip of the iceberg in terms of scandal. 1920, the president, Woodrow Wilson, or Edith Wilson, uh, set aside three tracts of oil-rich land to be used in national emergencies. The oil fields were located in Elk Hills in Buena Vista, California, in Teapot Dome, Wyoming. Wilson transferred control of the oil fields from the Secretary of the Interior to the Secretary of the Navy, who catalog them as Naval Oil Reserves number one, two, and three. Under the following administration of President Warren G. Harding, however, Secretary of the Interior Albert Fall advised the President, hey, give me control. I'll take control. You know what? Give it to me. Trust me. Trust me. I'll take over it. Take it away from the Navy. On uh, May 21st, 1921, Executive Order 3474, Harding uh, takes the control out of the Navy's hands and gives it to this guy who would turn out to be one of the largest thieves in United States history. Senator Albert Fall becomes Secretary of the Interior. Uh, 11 months earlier, there were rumors in 1921 of a shady deal after local Wyoming oilmen noticed trucks with the Sinclair logo. Take the logo off. If they see it's Sinclair, they know something shady is going on. Hauling uh, oil field equipment up to teapot, uh, teapot dough. Uh, the Wall Street Journal broke the news about the deal in April 14, uh, 1922 article. The paper had reported un an unprecedented secret arrangement in which Fall, no competitive bidding, basically gave away the oil to his buddies, private oil company. The very next day, the Wyoming Democratic Senator John Kendrick introduced a resolution to open the Senate investigation into the dealings. And there was one question, how did this guy, Albert Fall, get 
rich so quickly? Well, he's corrupt. That's what the answer would have been. Kendrick, who is a Democrat from Wyoming, received a flurry of correspondence from constituents informing him of backroom deals that had resulted in the private leasing of the Teapot Dome land to attract uh, land track to Mammoth Oil Company uh, owned by Harry F. Sinclair. Earlier, the Elks Hill track had been leased to Edward L. Doheny, owner of the Pan American Petroleum and Transport Company. And there is fall again. Uh, both leases provide the terms very favorable to the oil companies and the Teapot Dome lease made without a competing bid. Neither the public nor Congress had been informed of the leases beforehand. Request for more information by Senator Kendrick was initially denied by Fall. And why not? He's going to implicate himself. Fall was uh, contending with another oil man and Harding supporter, Colonel James G. Darden, who claimed he had first dibs on the Teapot Dome site before Fall leased it to Sinclair. In a desperate move, Fall convinced a reluctant President Warren Harding to dispatch the U.S. Marines to halt Darden's efforts to drill at the site. We sent the military into the site. Scandal starts. Where's Harding? Where is Harding? Well, it might be in the back room of Man Britain. Uh, when the publishers of the Denver Post got wind of the confrontation, they published the incident and used threats of additional withering editorials about Teapot Dome to blackmail Sinclair into paying $1 million, $18,250,000 today, to them and another oil man who felt cheated by the Teapot Dome lease. <laughs> Harley, wary of more bad press, may have played a part in pressuring Sinclair to pay off the Denver Post publishers in the oil man. All the news fit to print? Hardly. Denver Post got a million dollars not to print some. Oh, uh, another one of Harding's boys, the very, very corrupt Postmaster General, Will Hayes. He was the guy who was the head of the Republican National Committee that got Harding collected. He resigned his cabinet post as uh, the US Postmaster General on January 14th he became the chairman of the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America shortly after the organization's founding. And his job, clean up the industry, because Fatty Arbuckle allegedly murdered and raped Virginia Rappé. Uh, Fatty Arbuckle was accused of the rape and murder of the model and the actress Rappé, and there were calls from religious groups for federal censorship of the movies. One thing I can tell you, 1915, Supreme Court ruled that movies did not have freedom of speech. They were silent movies also, but they didn't have freedom of speech. Hiring Hayes was a public relations ploy. Much was made of Hayes' conservative credentials, which included his roles as a Presbyterian deacon and past chairman of the Republican Party. Less than a week after his arrest in 1921, Arbuckle's films had been pulled from every screen in America. Art Buckle was accused of having caused Rappé's death and was tried three times. He was acquitted, acquitted for the final time on April 12th. They had no evidence. Well, Fatty Arbuckle should have gone on in life. He was accused falsely, but he didn't. One week later, Will Hayes banned Fatty, Ar Fatty Arbuckle from appearing on screen. Hayes would change his mind about eight months later, but the damage was done. Fatty Arbuckle was unmarketable. And he had signed about a three or four million dollar contract prior to this all happening to him. And he blew all his money in lawyer fees. Hayes was now the movie studio's morality enforcer, although his main job was to plead with individual state censor boards not to edit films because the studios had to pay for it. Midterm election, there is Warren G. Harding. And his Republican Party seems to be in trouble. Uh, yeah, they followed through on a lot of the campaign pledges. Uh, but one of them, cutting taxes for the rich, did not appeal to the everyday person. The economy had not returned to normalcy. Uh, with unemployment at 11%, organized labor was angry over the outcome of uh, strikes, which didn't get them anything. In the elections, Republicans suffered major losses in the House and the Senate. 
Uh, I don't know how much you know about Warren G. Harding. Know anything about him? Harding supports a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Did you know that? 1922. 1922. September 21st, a resolution signed by President Warren Harding to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine per the 1917 Balfour Declaration. He is the first President of the United States who goes on record saying that a Jewish homeland should exist in the Middle East. Now, whether he liked Jews or not, there's no indication either way. Harding declared, it is impossible for one who is studied at the service of the Hebrew people to avoid the faith that they will one day be restored to their historic national home and there enter on a new and yet greater phase of their contribution to the advancement of humanity. The passage of the resolution was critical in legitimizing Zionism within the American Jewish community, especially since it now had a stamp of approval from non, the non-Jewish world. Over there, over there, the war is over, but the aftermath isn't. First World War and its subsequent peace settlements gave rise to new ambitions, rivalries, and tensions. People had high expectations that the post-war peace settlement would create a new world order and ensure that the slaughter of the First World War would never be repeated. There are the four guys who carved up Europe, Woodrow Wilson, before his stroke, President of the United States, David Lloyd George, Orlando of Italy, Clemenceau of France. Uh, they carved up Europe, and they wanted to make sure Germany was severely punished, not Wilson, but the European people, and that a surrender in 1919 by Germany was not enough. German soldiers, like the wounded Adolf Hitler, were infuriated with the settlement. Why didn't Hitler hate Jews? Well, during the First World War, uh, between 1914 and 18, Adolf Hitler was a soldier of the German army. And in the war, he and many other German soldiers like him couldn't get over the defeat of the German Empire. German command spread the myth, the big lie, that the army had not lost on the battlefield, but they had been betrayed. Uh, by a stab in the back, as it was called at the time, Hitler bought into the lie, the big myth. Jews and communists had betrayed the country and brought a left-wing government to power that went to the throw in the towel. 1919, Hitler pens his first, oh, well, we find out about his anti-Semitism as he pens his a letter to a colleague that uh, became known as the Gemlich letter. It was about how horrible the Jews were. 1922, the Nazi party in Germany. By blaming Jews for the defeat, Hitler created a stereotypical enemy. According to the Austrian citizen, Hitler expelling the Jews was the solution to all problems in Germany. He wasn't advocating killing them at that point. 1920, it's February. Hitler is in Munich, and this is the basis of Nazism. It's February 24th. Uh, the German Workers' Party already existed. Hitler was a great orator, laid out a 25-point platform. His central idea, strengthen German citizenship by excluding and controlling Jewish people and others deemed non-German. Hitler was born in Austria. He's not a German. Some Germans began to support Adolf Hitler, even though Hitler is an Austrian citizen, not German, so he wouldn't qualify to be a German under his own doctrine. Hitler's beginnings. By 1921, he was the absolute Fuhrer of the NSDAP, uh, and he starts to gain more power and grow the party uh, as he brings in the former Air Force ace Hermann Goring and the former Army Captain for this round. New York Times put out a uh, profile of Hitler that year. November 21st, uh, the writer covering Hitler describes Hitler's ability to work a crowd into a fever pitch, and how Hitler condemned Jews. Mussolini's Italy, and it goes real fast. His takeover of Italy into a fascist government accelerates. Uh, fascists were initially an urban phenomenon, motivated primarily by nationalism. 
They desired revenge against socialists and others who had not supported Italy's participation in the Great War. Fascist attacks against socialists, according to Benito Mussolini, were like assaults on an Austrian trench. He declared, this is heroism. Uh, this is the violence of which I approve and which I exalt. This is the violence of fascism. And uh, Mussolini's Italy got a bunch of guys behind them. And they went without any legal, without any legal cause, they went after people. During the high tide of uh, squadronism, uh, squadronismo, the uh, members of the fasci Italian de Combat Neto movement would uh, force uh, the official fascist party, mobilize tens of thousands, uh, even hundreds of thousands of Italian men who carried out thousands of acts of uh, brutal violence within their own communities, neighboring cities, towns, villages, and hamlets. Even before World War I's end, veterans who later became fascists were calling for the expatriation of Italy's internal enemies, whom they held responsible for Italy's crushing defeat uh, to Austro-Hungarian and German forces in the 1917 Battle of Caporetto. Uh, Marxists and socialists, Marxists and socialists. Uh, in Po Valley, the socialists established a virtual state within the state when they control of municipal government, labor exchanges, and peasant wage unions. Socialists also formed uh, cooperatives, cultural circles, taverns, sporting clubs. Such working class organizations existed, uh, uh, exercised their power largely through legal means, elections, boycotts, strikes, demonstrations, which nonetheless uh, often led to clashes with police, with injuries and deaths on both sides. Political culture and social order have been radically altered, with rough peasants and workers occupying the walls of power and red flags hanging from town walls. For landowners, life in this new red state meant higher wages, higher taxes, reduced profits, lost uh, managerial authority, uh, deteriorated private property rights, and, and the threat for social revolution. Mussolini's Italy. Displays of red flags, busts of Karl Marx, and international slogans offended nationalist and patriotic middle class uh, sentiments. Conservatives denounced the red terror and the atrocities of this period, though the landowners and the middle class were in little physical danger. They were not physically assaulted, nor were their homes, offices, private property damaged, destroyed. In the provincial centers, fascist violence was initially used to break the socialist hold uh, on local administrations and labor organizations. Fascists interrupted meetings, beat elected officials, and made impossible the work of local government. Socialists, in particular, were in particular were intimidated, threatened, and beaten until they were resigned. The consequences for the Socialist Party, was, uh, which was uh, entirely unprepared to counter-organize paramilitary violence, were disastrous. That's uh, Mussolini coming to power. It didn't take him very long. It took him less than three years. Uh, in the province of Bologna, one of the reddest provinces in the entire Po Valley, where the Italian Socialist Party received three quarters of the vote in 1919, the fascists demolished the Socialist Party in a matter of months. Between March and May 1921, the squads uh, destroyed dozens of newspaper offices, chambers of labor, peasant leagues, cooperatives, and social clubs. Uh, through the north and central Italy, uh, re fascists replaced, uh, replicated this feat, having conquered uh, major provincial centers. Fascists spread out into small towns and hamlets, Major cities provided launching points for attacking other cities. Having consolidated power in these places, the squads had moved into the more peripheral areas. There is Mussolini. He had his followers. People followed him. Uh, after rooting socialists out of the community, fascists commonly held a public ceremony inaugurating a new fascio. As fascism uh, penetrated smaller rural communities and became a mass movement without precedent in Italian history. 
After failing the 1919 elections, Mussolini entered Parliament in 1921. It took him, what, nine months? Uh, as a right-wing member, the fresh seating uh, forced armed squads to terrorize Mussolini's former socialist colleagues. The government seldom interfered. They were in on it. Uh, in return for the support of a group of industrials and uh, agricultural people, Mussolini gave his approval to strike-breaking and abandoned revolutionary uh, agriculture. And then, a march on Rome. The gathering of about 30,000 black shirts succeeded with the march on Rome, October 28th, and that forced the Prime Minister, uh, Luigi Factor, to resign in a uh, fascist government is in Syria. Took a year. Took a year. That's it. On October 31st, King Victor Emmanuel III formally appoints Mussolini Prime Minister. November 16th, in his first speech to the Chamber of Deputies, Mussolini declared, I could have shut down Parliament and set up a government exclusively of fascists. I could have, but at least at this early stage, I have not wanted to. Meanwhile, back in the USSR, these guys are not exactly buddies, Lenin and Stalin. On December 30th, in post-revolutionary Russia, the Union of, Social, uh, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics is established, comprising a federation of Russia, Belarusia, Ukraine, and the Trans-Caucasian uh, Trans, uh, Federation. The Soviet Union had its origins in the Russian Revolution of 1917, Radical leftist revolutionaries overthrew the Russian Tsar, Nicholas II, ending centuries of Romanov rule. The Bolsheviks established a socialist state in the territory that was once the Russian Empire. Back in the USSR, a long and bloody civil war followed. The Red Army, backed by the Bolshevik government, defeated the White Army, which represented a large group of loosely allied forces, including monarchists, capitalists, and supporters of other forms of socialism. In a period known as the Red Terror, Bolshevik secret police carried out a mass a campaign of mass executions against supporters of the Tsarist regime and against Russia's upper classes. Me and Vladi Lenin in St. Petersburg, 2011. Uh, the newly established Communist Party led by Marxist revolutionary uh, Vladimir Lenin took control of the government. Lenin began to harbor serious doubts about one member of his inner circle, Joseph Stalin, who became the general secretary of the Communist Party in April. After experience poor health uh, in 1921, Lenin suffered a stroke in May, a second in December. That month, Stalin took personal control of Lenin's care and the only guy who had access to him. But a very ill Lenin in 1922 dictated a final testament in which he famously urged his comrades to think about a way of removing Stalin from his post. How many of you liked Eskimo bars? Eskimo bars? Ice cream with chocolate covering? Yeah. Uh, Eagle Gook. I ain't mad at anybody. He's enjoying an Eskimo pie a pure milk chocolate coated ice cream bar. Well, it makes its debut uh, in 1922. Uh, it was invented by Christian Kent Nelson in his home lab in 1920. On uh, January 24, 1922, Nelson uh, patented his invention. By spring 2000, 700 manufacturers sold one million Eskimo pies per day. One million to my wife is not a pull shark. But uh, on September 1st, a new law went into effect in New York City. It required all pool rooms to change their names to billiard rooms or halls. Uh, the pool halls had to be closed by midnight. No one under the age of 18 allowed inside. All the tables had to have an unobstructed views. Sounds classier than a pool joint, doesn't it? Uh, oh, straw hats. Remember straw hats? Well, there was the New York straw hat riot. Every man will want a straw hat tomorrow. Over the course of eight days, beginning on September 13, boys and men fought each other on the streets of New York, resulting in injury, jail time, and general mayhem. 
In the early 1900s, straw hat season for men customarily began on May 15th, straw hat day. It ended on September 15th, felt hat day, and was considered an adequate violation to wear the wrong hat outside of these days. In the 1920s, gangs of uh, teen and preteen boys began harassing voter donor men and stealing or smashing their hats, sometimes their skulls. These attacks and skirmishes went on for eight days with mobs of hundreds on the street. Many men fought back and youths were brought to night court in front of the magistrate Peter A. Haddon. Haddon, H-A-T. Coincidence, I guess. Who handed down fines and some short jail stays. Well, there's somebody during the Charleston, 1922, the flapper lifestyle and look uh, disappeared at the end of the Roaring Twenties because of the uh, Wall Street crash. Uh, in 1963, Betty Friedan released the book, The Feminine Mistake, which referenced the flapper, flappers. That would be the start of the 1960s women rights movement. Prohibition ended in 1933. Ku Klux Klan continued to grow and then die in 1925. Uh, they had a march on Washington in 1925, but one of its most powerful leaders, David C. Stevenson, he was the grand powerful cyclops of Indiana. Uh, his power went beyond Indiana, uh, was accused of uh, abducting and raping and murdering a young woman. It was his trial and he was convicted. His disgrace was a major blow to the KKK and basically kind of put it back in the box. Uh, the civil rights era would open it up again in the 1950s and 60s. No Nazis in Germany. Uh, Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party uh, rose to power by 1932. Hitler and Mussolini were allies. Germany annexed Austria and Czechoslovakia in 1938. Czechoslovakia invaded Poland September 1st. 1939 started World War II. Japan bombed Pearl Harbor December 7, 1941. The war ended in 1945. The Nazi party outlawed in Germany. Uh, the Teapot Dome scandal, Congress uh, directed Harding to cancel the lease. The uh, Supreme Court declared the lease as fraudulent, ruled illegal Harding's transfer of authority to Albert Fall. Uh, he was convicted of accepting a bribe in the Elks Hill negotiations in prison. Edward Delhi uh, and uh, Harry Sinclair acquitted the charges of bribery and, con and criminal conspiracy. Sinclair would go to jail for six and a half months contempt of the U.S. Senate. Um, although the Secretary of the Navy, uh, Edward Denby, uh, had signed the leases, he was cleared of all charges. Uh, and there was Harding. Harding is considered one of America's worst presidents because of the Teapot Dome uh, scandal, bribery scandal, and Fall would go to uh, prison eventually. Uh, Harding was an accused adulterer, subject of a 1927 best selling memoir by Nan Britton, claimed to be his mistress and the mother of his illegitimate daughter. 2015, DNA testing revealed that, yeah, Harding did have a daughter with Nan Britton. Harding did some good things. Uh, the country came out of the recession in good shape. He advocated for labor reform and the foundations of the eight-hour work week. Through multiple treaties, the United States uh, succeeded, slowing down a naval's race. Uh, Will Hayes? Well, uh, Will Hayes uh, does take over. And uh, by 1930, he would impose a morals clause into performance contracts. Um, and uh, he would also have a do's and don'ts in the movies. Straw hats. Straw hats would actually fade from fashion. President Calvin Coolidge and uh, Walt, Walter Johnson, this, uh, Washington Senator's picture. Um, the ownership of the Eskimo Bar brand has changed many times. Today it's owned by Forneri, known as Edie's Pie. On October 2nd, 2020, Dryer's Grand Ice Cream announced its Eskimo Pie ice cream bars would be rebranded, acknowledging in the statement that the ice cream name was derogatory. That came, uh, the change came in early in 2021. And finally, billiards. Finally. Still in New York, it's called Billiards or Billiards Hall. 
it is no longer, or it still is not called, pool hall. There are a few remaining spots to shoot pool in New York City, and uh, they're called billiard parlors. Technically, there are no pool halls in New York City. Any questions, any comments about this? Anybody have any?